All right, hello guys, and glad to have you on board again today for our daily review, in which we have a look at intraday trading sessions and stuff like that. Okay, uh, so uh, sorry for the delay, first of all. I was supposed to record this one yesterday, but I simply couldn't find the time to do so. Uh, and also going to have to apologize because next week is going to be off. I am headed for uh, Istanbul into the Cosmoverse conference, and therefore I will be absolutely unable to figure out the time to record uh, neither the weekly briefing and the intraday briefing likely as well. So, uh, uh, of course, everything goes back to normal the week right after that. Okay, enough for the intro. Uh, just another thing, uh, I finally have listened to uh, some feedback and I kind of decided that, well, my personal decisions don't necessarily have to impact the quality of the educational content and therefore I finally decided to um, agree on moving away from futures contracts when it comes to educational content just because it makes things more complicated uh, uh, both for you and for me uh, in terms of educational content. So I decided to switch to US 500 which is a CFD contract. I've been taking the one from Pepperstone if you want to have the same as I do, it's uh, up to you, of course. Uh, yeah. But the thing is that, well, that, of course, erases all of the uh, um, things we mentioned before, like the rollovers, the gaps and stuff like that. There's no such a thing when you look at CFD contracts. So that's the reason why I'm going to be doing this. The other uh, uh, familiar stuff with this is that there will be no price difference between the S&P uh, as a uh, CFD uh, and the cash contract, which means you can port the prices from one to another. So it makes the whole process a lot simpler. That's the reason why I have decided to go by that now. Uh, okay, so that aside, let's do the regular stuff. Remember, we're still in a confluence uh, 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 of tricky area because we've got lots of contradictory, uh, contradictory signals. We can also assess two potential trading directions in the same time and therefore that can be pretty inconvenient for some of you but you're gonna have to get used to this quick reminder of this is that we're in a flow sequence so you need to be uh, aware of that sequence i hope you are this is the cheat shit of it so you go easy on that one the sequence can't take any more than three flows after you got the full sequence like the first flow which you don't trade the second flow you can trade the third which you quickly take your profits on at any reverse signal and then you're gonna get to wait for two bearish consolidations uh, in the sense of a bullish flow of course you can reverse engineer that stuff on the opposite direction of course and then after you waited for two consecutive cons uh, corrective flows you can start a new sequence of five flows so that's really the way we are though remember when it comes to s p 500 we have that big massive bullish area on the weekly charts okay that's the one that we have highlighted there okay that's the one we have with the low risk strategy okay so that was big bullish area and now that we are in a bearish area okay same thing that's the reason why we could start trading bearish flows out of there okay and remember you never buy into a sellable area so there is really mandatory minimum 4480 if you want to ever buy or put a buy contract on the s p 500 the same story in here you were absolutely unable to sell out of this area okay so very important for you to understand so if we now go back to the cfd contract okay Oh, and some of you will say that, will say, oh, Phil, look at that. The context haven't reversed in the weekly chart of the uh, Pepperstone contract. Well, remember that, folks. This is the contract you use for flow trading. This, the true S&P cash market, is the one you use for longer term assessment. And yes, you're going to have to switch between the two. Okay, so this one is the one which I use for context. And as you can see, the indicators can be pretty sensitive. Just a slight difference in prices can cause severe differences in the indicator plotting. Okay, so gonna have to fairly assess this one, guys. Okay, but one thing for sure, we've done our analysis here. We're in a bearish area, so we go flow trading with the intraday data afterwards. Okay, that's really important for you to make that distinction. That means we're now in this chart in h1 time frame in an area in which we could start looking for flows and remember we had that initial bearish sequence that initiated itself with that first flow in here you can see the moving average has been diving away 
from the resistant context or the resistant context that's dived below the falling moving average, which means, yeah, first flow is in here. Then we waited for the third range boundary. That's all in the thing. It's just reverse uh, what you have in here. Uh, and that's it. That means you had a selling opportunity at the Bollinger Band, sorry, at the moving average and the Bollinger Band. Okay. Though personally, I decided to go for the Bollinger Band and didn't take the moving average, but you could very well have done both. Okay. Then out of this, pretty damn simple and straightforward, you wait for breakout of the previous low point, which is the new thing. Since the last time we talked to each other, we now have a breakout. We now have broken the low point, which means anybody who trade either the Bollinger Band or the moving average should have it stop at break even. Okay, remember that's what the sequence tells you. The sequence says this, okay? If you've taken that trade, moving average or Bollinger Band, okay? you are going to have to wait until the next stage goes in, which is put your stop at break even when you break the previous stop, okay? That, though that really is the way to go. We've broken the previous bottom in here, so stops are at break even, and there's no other way around, okay? And now the next step is you're gonna wait for a third range boundary. So for now, I don't know, I see so many people saying, for whatever reason, uh, it goes down too quick, it's unhealthy, the market shouldn't be that violent or whatever, the market is going high or low for good or bad reasons. Don't ever go this, okay? Remember that the flow sequence strategy is damn dumb simple, okay? It's really the way it goes. You can't control the dynamic and you never will. You can't control the duration, you can't control the pace. So you're gonna have to embrace those high level of uncertainty. Flow trading is certainly the simplest strategy uh, there is. But the thing is that it comes along with some negative effects. The negative effect is the variance of such structure. They, you will rarely see two flows looking alike. It's really not that simple. It's really, really, really a lot more difference and variance in the structure. And that's the reason why it creates hell a lot of uncertainty and impatience biases, which you should never let go through, okay? So don't take your profits too soon because for whatever reason you fear of a huge V-shaped reverse, yet sometime it will happen. Okay, it definitely will happen sometimes, but there's nothing you should care about. It's none of your concern, okay? Right now, you need to wait for a third range boundary. If such a thing occurs, you know that you're gonna have to take your profits on the third range boundary, and that's pretty much all there is to know, okay? Let it ride as long as it has to. And remember for the, for the ones that were trading the bullish sequence, and remember you can definitely trade both, and I actually do trade both personally, is that, well, we still have a third flow to go on the sequence. We've gone one, two, remember? One, two flow, okay? Which means the third flow in the bull side in here was totally doable. How do we do trade this one? Remember the third flow can only come from the Bollinger Band. So in here, it had to be the lower Bollinger Band. So that means starting in here, I was able to buy, which is exactly what I've done. I haven't been waiting for any such a thing as a signal. Like I said, I had a bearish trade. So I was kind of safe buying in here. It's just reducing my bearish exposition. That's where the way it goes. I'm both buying and selling. And now I'm waiting for this trade to either deliver or get stopped out. Of course, remember the stops are needed to be taken according to the potential risk you take, okay? You never put more stops than the distance of what you expect to get. In here, remember, the third flow is that, well, I'm gonna have to break the previous high points, okay? So we know that the minimum target for this trade is 4,600. Okay, if this trade delivers the gains, there's no way I can put my trade at break even until we break 4600. So we know that the deliverance on this trade, and you don't know how far it can go, can go much higher than that, but the bare minimum is going to be 4600. That means no matter how hard you try, there's no way you can put a stop loss bigger than this. Okay, the lower the stop loss you could take for these types of trade, which is where I traded personally, is 4100. Oh, here's another rule is that no matter what as well, you will never be able to put your stops below the previous low point, the, the previous flow low point, which is in here, which means the minimum stop loss is, uh, is 4,050. Okay, so that's really the way it goes. So 
personally, I'm not really in a tricky moment situation trying to figure out what the market is going to do and if it does it for good or bad reasons. I have both a bear and a bull trade, both in different configurations. I don't know which one is going to succeed. They can actually have both succeeding and I would be pretty damn happy with that. Until then, well, it can go low, as low as it wants to, and it's none of my concern. As long as I don't have a reversal signal, I'm not going to take my profits on the bear trade. And for the bull trade, well, you're going to have to go 4100 if you want to take my stop loss. And if it happens, well, once again, I'll be happy with it. It's just the way it goes. I can't control the prices. I can't control the market. I can't control the timing and I neither can control the distance. So you're going to have to get familiar with that high level of uncertainty. That's really the thing that comes along with simple strategies. Okay. There's also another thing that I really wanted to highlight in this week's educational content is that the general mistake that I see with people trading flow tradings and intraday sessions like that is they generally tend to make that dangerous shortcut of saying, well, yeah, I don't like this shit show of uh, uh, looking at the larger time frames. This sounds oddly complicated. Uh, this lower strategies, this ranges, trend sequencing stuff that Phil seems to be doing in the weekly charts and stuff uh, in the weekly and monthly charts. I'm so. Uh, well, I could just use that sequence. It seems like a much easier thing to handle. Well, don't ever do this. The number one mistake is that one, is to forget that you don't even figure out a sequence if you don't have the time frame to look for it. So the reason why we looked at the H1 time frame is because we have weekly resistant context and we had weekly supports back in the last October. And until then, we've been trading those sequences based on that thing. But don't ever forget that the time frames will change over time. And if you don't adjust accordingly, and if for whatever reason you say, yeah, you know what, the nice time frame to trade the S&P 500 for flows is one hour. Well, truth is it's not. Sometimes it will be one hour, sometimes it will be four hours, some even times it will be 15 minutes or so. But these things will change over time. And if for that reason you forget to do the lower strategy adjustment first, well, good luck trading out of nowhere with non-changing time frames. Simple strategies need to have complexity at some sort of point in time. It's really not that simple. If someone just tells you, yeah, trading is easy, you just do this, this, and that. And you get the buy signal and the perfect sell signal. I mean, fuck it. You all know this doesn't work. So please be smarter than that. Okay. The complexity comes from two things. When it comes to flow trading, the complexity comes from you still need to assess the value. And this is the low risk strategy, uh, the true market value. Remember, flow trade is just moving prices from area A to area B. But those areas aren't just randomly defined those areas are defined by low risk strategy where the actual market value is okay and this is something that remember this is not a zero-sum game if you think that trading is all about just the winners and the losers and the winners taking the money out of the losers no that's what happened with flow trading and volatility but that's definitely not what happens in the rest of the market the rest of the market is just giving prices to assets and that's it and you can't just randomly price an asset it just doesn't work that way so that's really the way it goes. Understand the sequence you're in, figure out the time frame in which you can trade those long, those shorter time frame kind of flow trade, apply the goddamn sequence, which is yes, very simple, but comes with contradictory elements. It's very simple and easy to understand. It gives you quite confidence in the rule set. I mean, the rules are just, I, I couldn't make any simple than that. Okay, any more simple than that. Once you figure that one out, remember that the advantage you have with a simple strategy comes with its own negative consequences. The negative consequence is don't ever forget about the low risk strategy assessment first to figure out the right time frame to trade it on. And the second thing is that it's simple, but it comes with high uncertainty and high impatience biases because of this high variance that these structures will take. The best example I could take out of it is to, for example, use the uh, um, uh, Elliott wave analogy. Uh, Elliott wave is definitely a good strategy to be used on the larger time frames where the value actually moves. Uh, uh, but when it comes to the shorter time frames, it's so much more chaotic and due to market makers activities and volatility arbitrage that there's really not such a thing as a structure that repeats itself like the A, B's and C's and whatever. And this is where personally, well, I do like some of the things that comes from Elliott wave theories, but I just says yeah, it's utterly complicated when it comes to studying the noise, studying the things that go infinitely complex because the structure can vary so much. 
So this is why in these contexts, I've opted with my strategy for a much simpler approach. Makes things real simple, provide a strategy that doesn't get too much in complexity, still does provide a positive risk reward ratio out of dozens of trades. And there's no way you can guarantee the outcome of a single trade. Don't ever believe that. That trade, yeah, even if, for example, you sold in here or there, your stop is at break even, that certainly doesn't mean you're out of, uh, you're, you have a guaranteed gain. There are some rare cases in which this thing will V-shape reverse and you're going to be stopped at break even. You will lose your gains. And if you get yourselves mad with that, well, just remember that this is one out of so many trades you're going to take with this strategy. The overall net is beneficiary. Don't ever go personal with one trade. Okay? Rule number one. Rule number two, all the trades will have different plots, different sequence, different stuff like that. They just follow the overall set of sequence, but the variance in the way they move and the fastest points between A and B. And remember, momentum and duration, you can't control this. So try not to fall for it, okay? That's really the downside of flow trading. It comes along with very tricky management of emotions. And it's always going to come down to the two flows that every human has against trading, impatience biases and fear of uncertainty. Okay, never ever let them trigger any actions whatsoever. It's really the way it goes. You have a simple set of rules that you need to follow. Okay, these rules don't predict the market. They just provide positive risk reward ratios and positive reward expectations out of dozens of trades. There's no way you can lose money with these things out of, a, out of dozens or, or 50 trades. You, you can certainly lose money out of three and four trades. It's just randomness, okay? So remember that chaos is out there. There's no way you can control the market. And the best possible way to get rid of those fears is not to trade, 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 trade. It's to go by and do some research yourself. Remember the thing that you have everywhere in crypto, the DYOR, do your own research. Well, that comes along as well. There is some random guy on the internet that tells you, yeah, this thing brings positive reward. Just trust me. No, it's not that way. It's just, God damn it, take those charts, random charts. There's an infinity of assets you can study. You can replay on those assets. So try to do that thing. Take a random asset, one that I don't study for you, okay? Just don't listen to the teacher and apply dumbly, okay? Just don't try to copy me. Just try to see for yourself. You take a random asset, you figure out the low risk strategy, and you go three time frames below. You position yourself out of the low risk area, and you look for the flow sequence. And do it yourself. Do it with a replay, and figure it out by yourself that out of 50 trades, was it profitable? Would it have been profitable back then? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, you will have much more trust in following those rules the next time around. And that's really the way it goes. That's how you guys learn these strategies. It's, and it works for mine or any other strategy you might be learning out there. There's no better way to learn but to go for replays. J just don't ever believe that uh, you'll get better at trading by just trading more. It's not the way it goes. Trading more is generally falling for the, ins for the impatience bias, okay? The trades are gonna be triggered and you have, have had no control of the time in which they do. So you better have to make good use of your time in the meantime Instead of over trading, try to look for past trades. Try to learn the strategy. Try to um, get control over the appliance of rules. And most importantly, just figure out for yourself if it works or not. Just take on the things. Look for yourself. Do your own research. That's the best advice I can give you guys today. Until then, remember I told you there will be no podcast next week. So see you guys in a couple of weeks. Until then, well, take on that assumption and just apply this. There will be no podcast next week. So take your charts and do your own. Okay? See you guys in two weeks. Bye-bye.